This is like me with you and Brandon Sanderson. One day. Mm. Yeah, you're really not selling that book. <laughs> <laughs>the book mavens i'm amanda she's rachel and you're joining us for our falling for austin project as we read our way through the six completed works of jane austen to determine do you really need to read them or can can you just watch the movie we'll see in this week's episode we're discussing sense and sensibility which if you watched our intro video to this project i rated as my number one favorite book of Jane Austen's and Rachel ranked as her number two. Mm -hmm. It's up there. Okay, take it away, Rachel. All right, so Sense and Sensibility is a story about a relationship between sisters. To me, I find that to be the central storyline uh, here. So we have the Dashwood family, we have the eldest brother, John, and the three Dashwood sisters, uh, Eleanor, Marianne, and Margaret. Now, uh, their father, Mr. Dashwood is dying. Daughters can't inherit. The wife can't inherit. Everything goes to John. And John is married to this kind of hideous woman named Fanny. She's not physically hideous inside. When it where she's it counts, hideous. she's hideous, hideous where it counts. And kind of convinces him that he doesn't owe his stepmother and his half sisters anything. And so they're left kind of I don't want to say beggared, but but basically. Yeah, they're, so they're, they're going to have to rely on the help of friends. So, um, Eleanor writes a lot of letters. Ooh, Eleanor, Eleanor does mm -hmm. it? Of course it's Eleanor. Yes. Uh, yeah, Eleanor to, does everything. To see, yes, true enough. To see where they could land, somewhere where they could be able to support themselves on this pittance they're getting every year. And they end up uh, talking to Mr. John Middleton, who sets them up at Barton Cottage. And it's right on the seashore mm -hmm. and beautiful location, beautiful scenery. And uh, the majority of the story takes place in their time at the cottage. Ability. Okay, first line. It's a short one. <laughs> it is, finally, some punctuation. The family of Dashwood had long been settled in Sussex. That's it. That's, That's all it. Got. Short, sweet. <laughs> Short, sweet, to the point. All right. How do you feel about Eleanor? Well, I love Eleanor. I love that she's she's the centralized figure for her family. She holds it together. Her mother is not the most reliable person. Very passive. Mm -hmm. um, relies heavily on Eleanor to be able to handle the business um, of just them being able to function year to year. So Eleanor is the one who makes the budgets. She really figures out what they can afford. And that's a big job. And she, she definitely takes it on um, as well as trying to manage Margaret, uh, the little, the littler sister, who's I think like 13. Yeah. She's, book. she's much younger than the uh, older two. Like the older two are marriageable Mm -hmm. age adults if you will and Marianne's what like 17 17, 16, 17. Mm -hmm. and I think I think Eleanor's only like, like 19, 19 or 20, 20. and it, so there, it's kind of a gap mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh I mean Eleanor she she does fall in love with Edward what's the word I'm looking for it's not it's not as passionate as what you get with Marianne's it's storyline it's deep it is deep it, she does kind of have this long suffering situation it's very, plus she gets it's horribly very Jane. treated yes by uh lucy Steele mm -hmm. and lucy Steele's sister um lucy Steele, and she has a actually a long-term secret engagement with edward ferris and when she hears about eleanor and the possibility that edward and eleanor had some kind of connection she comes and visits just to kind of stir the pot yeah stir the really pot. and uh well, isn't it, isn't it, um, Fanny kind of takes the Steel Sisters under her wing for a little bit, and Anne, the younger one, ends up letting it out of the bag about this mm -hmm. secret romance, uh, oh, and with her brother. Fanny has them out and of Fanny the house. Has so, fit. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a very uh, memorable scene in the book, and uh, she ends up running off with Robert, the younger Ferris mm -hmm. brother. Uh, Lucy Steele does so that's a very interesting storyline and Lucy Steele you know that devious female character she has one in and, every book yeah and the like really awful doesn't treat people like she should character mm -hmm. she's the Mrs. Norris mm -hmm. Fanny is uh their brother's wife is the mm -hmm. 
she's the villain, the bad, you know. Well, she just doesn't want to share. Yeah. You know, she wants she's it all. Selfish. She's selfish. She's the selfish one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. oh, Eleanor. I love and Eleanor. Edward, Edward is just, I mean, he's, he's a little passive, but he does have. I love it. What I like about Edward, yes, is that he is willing, like, he doesn't want to tarnish Lucy Steele's reputation, so he will not say, like, the reasons why their engagement is broken to preserve her reputation. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you have to admire that. I mean, he's always trying to do the right thing. He doesn't know how to handle this kind of pickle that he got himself in. And But he does come out in the end, and he's willing to give up his family inheritance in order to be with a woman he loves. Mm -hmm. And so that's very admirable. And, of course, Colonel Brandon really kind of saves the day of course for does. them because Colonel Brandon yeah. is awesome. Oh, right? Underrated. He is awesome. Ed, I, I, is he underrated? I don't know. Who, oh. who like, overlooks Colonel Brandon? Who overlooks Who's ta Everybody Colonel always Brandon. talks about Darcy, and he's great. Don't get me wrong. But, like, people are not raising Colonel Brandon as the romantic hero that I think he deserves to be. But Colonel Brandon and Darcy have a lot in common. I mean, Darcy right? has the sister who's ruined by Wickham, or almost ruined by almost Wickham. Ruined and then you him. have Willoughby, who ruined not Eliza, but Eliza's daughter. Uh -huh. I remember it. <laughs> uh -huh. um, uh, okay, so Colonel Brandon had a brother as well. Wasn't it with the brothers? And he fell in love with this girl, Eliza. She wasn't deemed suitable. He went off and fought in the army. Meanwhile, she ends up marrying his brother and is horribly mistreated and is turned out and ends up having this, this daughter who's also named is Eliza. And Colonel Brandon comes back from the army and finds out all of these things that have gone on and ha and tracks her down to a poorhouse and takes and she dies and he takes over raising her daughter mm -hmm. and it's because he's awesome because he loves her and, and but the but the mm. the daughter ends up eliza jr i guess we should call her ends up involved with willoughby and willoughby had impregnated her and so, meanwhile, you have this whole romance going on between Willoughby and Marianne. Meanwhile, Colonel Brandon knows that he's mm, doesn't really want to say anything. He doesn't want to ruin Marianne's happiness, news even bears. though that even though he's in love with her himself. And so, there's like I see parallels with Darcy. Darcy doesn't want to get in the way of mm. Wickham and Elizabeth, but he had information he should have shared, and that of course ends up with you know that Liddy ends up running off with with Wickham. It's something he could have prevented had he said something. Right. And, you know, but anyway, I mean, but there's a lot of parallels isn't there. That, but isn't that always the way of nature, true? Like, it's like when to share information you have and when to be silent. That's always hard. When you want people to be able to make their own decisions. Right. And so, right. you know, a lot of freedom to do so. But Colonel Brendan's amazing. How he is with Marianne, this whole backstory, this tragic backstory when he knows about Willoughby. And when he finally does share it, it's because Marianne's suffering. Mm -hmm. And that he tells this to Eleanor. And Eleanor, of course, lets Marianne know all of this this whole story that you know he is not somebody she needs to be wasting her time on and mourning over this loss he was not worth it so i always i always really love colonel brandon plus he goes and gets her out of the ring <laughs> yeah finds her and she wanders off like an idiot i have okay. to kind of talk to the, about them together okay. eleanor and edward here's okay. what i love about them i i love i love their commitment right they're very committed to trying to do what is right and to keep their word. And I think that's very admirable. And in Eleanor, her, she's committed to her family, which I admire. I'm very committed to my family. Like, I find her, I know it's very frustrating for people the way that she like waits for Edward and that kind of stuff. But I see a, a lot. Fading price element. It is a little bit of a fading <laughs> price element. But but the difference is is that when the opportunity does allow, they both act right. Like they both seize those opportunities once they're available. But they spend a lot of their Where does relationship. She seize opportunities. Oh, when he comes, she says, "Heck yeah, let's do this." Oh, when he finally confesses everything at the very end of the book. Yes. Then. Well, that's not seizing opportunities. That's he confessed and that he's well, available Well, okay. Now. Let me put this a different way. Yes, put it in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> she's very passive to me she's, when it comes to She's Edward. only passive romantically. Eleanor well, yeah. is getting on with her life. Eleanor is building a life for herself and her family that is not dependent on marriage, that is not dependent on whatever Edward does or doesn't do. 
she is very much much an actor in her own story and she doesn't wait for marriage to come save her yeah i just don't i don't when i when i think about building i think about an advancement somehow it's very static in terms of, it's just really but about isn't, survival. But really isn't that the best they can hope for right now? It is, but then I, I think that maybe like overlooking the importance of one of them being able to find a suitable marriage. There's a there's a parallel between, I feel like with that and like with Pride and Prejudice, well, she, you still have She wants Marianne to do that. Well, yes, but I mean, Mrs. Dashwood also wants them to be able to make a good match. It's important. This whole idea of also being able to go to London which happens later on in the book, it's also about finding a good match because that's going to establish financial security. They're not financially secure at this point. And I'm not saying she's not, yeah. like, open to it. I'm just saying she's not sitting around twiddling her thumbs. Oh, no, she can't. She's right. she's okay. she is definitely the head of the household. Yeah. But, I mean, I just... I was just saying, saying that's just, my point. It's like, like really she's growing. not sitting there waiting on somebody to come in and save her. She is dealing with the cards that she's been dealt and doing the best that she can with the cards that she's been handed. And no, I admire I don't that. Think, yeah, I don't think she's waiting for Edward to come and financially save right. her Right, she's not waiting for That's anybody true. to come save her. She is living her own life. And that, and I like that. I like that about her very much. I also love, I find the way that Eleanor internalizes things very, um, I see myself in that. That's part of my love for Eleanor as well. I, she does she's have an internalizer internalize and I'm a heavy internalizer. And... Yeah. She doesn't share with Marianne, which I think is interesting because Marianne, Marianne holds things back as well. But I think that their relationship as sisters, when they finally let each other in mm -hmm. on these other levels, it deepens that relationship between the sisters. And that's, that's uh, to me, the best relationship of the whole mm -hmm. yeah. thing is between her and Marianne. Yeah. It's a beautiful relationship. And I think it's just a very difference of, I think some of it is a difference of temperament and age. And I mean, they're very close in age, but temperamentally, they're very different. Very different. And so that creates a maturity dynamic that it takes them a while to overcome. Like, well, Marianne doesn't have to assume this place of responsibility and accountability. Right, because Eleanor, Eleanor did. And, and that's the other thing, too. But Eleanor doesn't resent Marianne that, although, no. which is eventually what their breaking point is. That, that kind of argument outbreak they eventually have is my favorite scene of the whole book, where Marianne is like, you know, oh, but you feel nothing and blah, 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 blah. And then Eleanor has finally had enough. And she's like, I could, I could show enough evidence of a broken heart, even for you. Mm -hmm. But, and then Marianne realizes that she's been so self-absorbed in her own things that she did not pick up that her sister was hurting. And her sister who had been keeping it to herself this whole time realizes that her sister really could have been a comfort to her if she would have opened up moment. and allowed it. It's, it's, my, it's my favorite scene of the whole book. It's not actually any of the like romantic scenes. It's that scene between the sisters. It's my favorite. Because this is it's an emotional outpouring. So you really get to see their inner thoughts and their mm -hmm. feelings coming out. And it's not just what we're seeing that's been internalized. And I think that's just, it's a great dramatic moment of the book. I mean, to me, Sense and Sensibility is a very easy read. There's a lot mm -hmm. of stuff going on. There's a lot of humor in Sense yeah. and Sensibility. Mrs. Jennings, she's hilarious. So, <laughs> she's funny. Like, like there's, Yes, and how she nitpicks and picks and picks and picks at Marianne and Eleanor is um, very entertaining. There's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of solid humor, mm -hmm. I think, in this one. And Marianne, I appreciate Marianne as a character more as I get older. When I very first read this book, I, I think I was in my early 20s. I'm not, I'm not sure. I was in college, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was in college. And she frustrated me so much <laughs> because... She's so self-absorbed. She's in her story. Like she is, and she's just so, and that used to frustrate me so much. And now that I'm older, more experienced, I appreciate her more because she, okay, Marianne and Willoughby remind me sometimes of the way that our students are. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but sometimes when you're young, you're really, it's very impulsive. Right. It's impulsive. It's all consuming they're, you're really just not able to do it. Like, that is your whole world. You're, like, almost obsessively. And to everybody on the outside, it's like, okay. <laughs> and not that it's not sincere. And not that it's not genuine. And not that it's not real. It's just a difference. I think some of it is just the difference of of life experience, maybe. I don't really know. But I, I find them very frustrating in there. And I think because I do see myself more in Eleanor, this whole that, like, Eleanor is left to carry the weight. And um, 
Marianne spends a lot of the book, you know, kind of flitting around after Willoughby and oh, and dramatic poetry and blah, blah, blah. And like the younger Amanda <laughs> was very frustrated by that. Like, and now that I'm older, I see more of the dynamic between the sisters and that kind of stuff. And I appreciate it a lot deeper. It's just how they, how they express love. They, yeah, Eleanor internalizes, mm -hmm. Marianne externalizes. She doesn't feel like she has to hold those things back. And so, but see, what I like about Marianne in terms, especially of how Colonel Brandon talks of Marianne, her passion, her passion for life, her passion for love and these things, those, those attract Colonel Brandon to her. And I mean, I think that those are, those are not poor qualities. Mm -hmm. um, she's, she's living. Young. She's very she's, alive. Yes. And she's like, but I mean, you would want, <laughs> yeah, it would be very attractive. And I think, especially if we're looking at the time period in which they're living, that this, that Marianne is not afraid to express herself mm -hmm. that way and to know exactly where you stood mm -hmm. with her. And for someone like Colonel Brandon, who experienced so much tragedy and had loved a girl and he lost her. Who was so like that, you can see why that would be so attractive to really know where you stood with, with a woman. And I think that that's, that had obviously attracted Willoughby as well. You know, like that would have just been. Willoughby. Yeah, well, Willoughby's what a What a rake. Uh, he is a rake. He is an absolute rake. He's a rake of the worst kind. This is not the charming rake that I like. No, I don't like Willoughby. Um, he's 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 gotten a woman in trouble before. He ditches Marianne simply because he just cannot handle ending things in a clean way. There's no clean break, and then to see Marianne suffer with this, where she found, where she thinks that there's an understanding between her and Willoughby, and I think Willoughby did too at one point in time. But it becomes all about the money for Willoughby. He's not willing to sacrifice his inheritance to be able to marry Marianne. Mm. But I also think that Marianne initially when they find out who Willoughby is, that he was going to be financially stable. I think that was also part of it. Hmm. But his poor decisions came on Bruce. That's why he ends up losing Well, I mean, he money. wasn't going to be able to provide for them. And so he lets it go. He doesn't want to risk his social standing either. I mean, it's a selfish decision. And I'm sure Marianne, because she loved him, would have lived in a shack with him. It would have been fine. But I do think initially, knowing Willoughby, he was an acceptable person right. for, to pursue her because he did he did come from a wealthy family mm -hmm. so but as as with most things once information more information is available and i also but here's the thing in the long game i there's no way i see willoughby remaining faithful to to marianne oh, or, no. or, or treating her kindly and tenderly over time like he is he's a womanizer no he's, he's around around you be the next new thing Oh no, there's there's no question. I don't I don't think they would have been able to have any kind of long term happiness. But it's <sighs> but that line when she but let me say this: Marianne does show a lot of growth in the book, which I love. I love Marianne's growth in the book in the sense of like she comes to realize that love comes in many forms, and depth of feeling comes in many packages. Like I love that line when she's finally <laughs> when Eleanor's. She's finally looking at Colonel Brandon and all these things he's done for her just to make her happy, like having the piano for a tape rod or, or bringing her out of the rain or going and getting her mother and bringing her back. Like he does these things. These to, big gestures. These big gestures. Yeah, because, yeah, because he cares for her with no expectation that there will be anything else. He does them because he cares for her and he th believes that it will make her happy. Her happiness is like becoming his number one thing. And, and then she Makes recognizes so that, I know, she's like, he's the true romantic, I think, shows mm -hmm. so much growth. And I honestly think that that is one of the things that allows her to finally see her sister more fully. Maybe. The in the quieter way her, expression. The quieter expressions of, of love and devotion make them no less deep for being, pub like, publicity does not make the emotion deeper. And I think that Marianne comes to realize that, and that's what allows her to really fully embrace Colonel Brandon and the fabulousness that he is. Well, I think the Middletons and Mrs. Jennings yeah. um, kind of, I think, ruin anything that could have possibly developed naturally between Marianne and Colonel Brandon because they, they poke at her about it. And Marianne, being who she is, is like, you're not going to convince me that I need to be interested in anybody other than who I feel like I'm interested well, in. Well, and, and that's like, a little like bit that of her. they put her off. 
Colonel That's Brandon. A little bit of her out. obstinate headstrong. Oh no, absolutely. Well, she's a teenager and she's young, That's true. but you she's know, she's a young teenager. But too. having that life experience with Willoughby and and with her sister's pain and everything, I think she just she grows tremendously as a character. And see, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to see characters realize, hey, there's something going on here. I need to be handling it differently. I need to re-examine my emotions and the people around me, expand that view a little mm -hmm. bit in terms of how my actions are affecting those around me. And they just see that tremendous amount of growth with Marianne. And so it makes it such a compelling read to have that going on when you have characters that don't really change very much. Mm -hmm. That's just like nothing's really going on. It's just not, it's not going to be as interesting. And there's just so much character development. I feel like I love Marianne. I do. I love Marianne and I love Colonel Brandon. He's one of my, I think he's, well, he's going to be my top He's two. definitely one of my top, my Austin top slots men. for Austin men. Cause he's one of the best written too in the depth of, you understand him at a depth and a level that you like in the previous episode in Mansfield Park. You never really get to know any of those characters at the depth that you get to know Edward and Colonel Brandon. Like, you get to understand their motivations, their I don't history think you a little get bit deeper. As much with Edward as you get with Colonel I, Brandon. I, I think that's true. I think Edward is much more like on his face. She's much more forgiving of Edward than I, I am. I am more forgiving of Edward. I think, I think Edward. Well, we were talking about this off camera, but Edward made a lot of missteps with Eleanor. He did. He could have told her the truth. I mean, Lucy had no problem taking her into her confidence to tell her about the secret engagement. Like, there's just it's not much of a secret. You know? Yeah, like, this is so, like the worst kept secret. Um, the whole thing is like, so, okay. Um, and that he, I really feel like he was reluctant to tell her the truth because that meant that she could if she was open to it, pursue other avenues. And I think that keeping that from her limited Kind of like I can't, he, he he strings her along. That's that's what I'm like. Well, and he I strings her along and I, intentionally he, or not. I was that's say, what he does. He and does. He does. And leaves but, her dangling, and but, I see. I don't like that about him. But I think that's more realistic in a sense. And like, okay, Is it? here's my thing with Edward. It's not very honest. It's not very. It's not. It's not the most honest thing that he could have done. For me, the way I read the relationship is, I don't know that Edward. He and Eleanor kind of, in just circumstance, end up becoming friends very, very quickly and mm -hmm. realizing that they have many, many things in common. And I think it's a little bit of the Lizzie Bennet, sorry, line to pull in a different book. But I think he kind of found himself in the middle of his feelings before he realized they had begun. Because their their natural compatibility about worldview really accelerated their friendship in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. And so I don't necessarily think that he intended for them like to develop romantic feelings for her. And mayhaps was surprised by how quickly it developed. Now, I agree with you that he should have told her. It's called about, a paper and a pen. It's true. Dude. I you agree. Know, a lot of people write letters. He in should Austin's have books. told he her. Could have, you know, there wouldn't have been much of a story there. Like, I get it. You know, right. In terms of but, writing a story. But. And he, but he, like, he could have, he could have been honest. And he could have been honest. Everything without having, you know, she still could have experienced all this heartbreak and, right. and the he waiting could have told around, her. you know, that could have I happened. think that story wouldn't have been as good. I don't know. And I don't really blame, and this is the other thing too. I don't really blame Lucy Steele for her actions. Yeah. She's got, she's a gray character. She's, she is kind of gray. Like it, okay. When Edward meets her and becomes engaged to her, she's, she probably very sincerely had feelings for him. He is a, he's a great catch for her. He is a way up. He's a way out, which we've talked about many times for a lot of these books. But it like, was about whether or not he was going to inherit. Right. As the eldest. Right. And then I think she comes to town because she's jealous. She's no, no, worried absolutely. about Eleanor. Now, should she treat Eleanor that way? No. But she's also young and immature and concerned that her big prospect is, well, and about to move on. He had committed to her. He, he hadn't had. broken off he the had. engagement. So, like, mm. because he didn't want to break yeah. his word. And, like, I get it. And I find that in Admiral Crawley. But he, I also do get very frustrated with her because I'm like, Edward, mm, come on, sir. But then, like, uh, but then the whole scene where she gets, like, thrown out of the house because yeah, her, big sis dramatic scene. her sister lets the cat out of the bag, the worst kept secret ever, out of the bag. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, she runs off with the younger brother. Like, I mean, she, she's not a she's quality not a, person. She's not a quality person, but I don't necessarily, like, I I kind of see where she's coming from in the beginning, like how she inserts herself in our story, like where we are picking up. I kind of see it. She's jealous. She's worried. Limited prospects. You don't have a lot of options. This guy committed to me. 
And you we know, know what's and going here's on. The thing. She's she, years long engagement. She knows him. I'm going to come and I'm going to figure yeah. out what's going on. How else is she going to know? Yeah. She knows him. She knows he's going to stick to his word, but he just may need reminding of the word that he made to her. Yeah. I think so. I do think some Edward in his waitingness, putting it off. I think Edward is hoping that Lucy will become interested in somebody else. Maybe he's a bit of a Fanny Price. I, I think he, I think they're see. both, I think they're what? both a little bit <laughs> Fanny <laughs> Price. Like so he's kind happen? of waiting, hoping that it will resolve itself. I, I believe which is Edward, stupid. Yeah. <laughs> which I mean, but I will say this, nobody, <laughs> when you're on the outside of this situation, like when it's your friends, you know that that's not going to work out and you know that it's not going to do it. And so you're like, listen, you got to do something. But when it's you, again, as a person who is excellent at just putting <laughs> off things they don't, they're, that make them uncomfortable or conversations they don't want to have with people, <laughs> then you know that you're like, you're kind of willing to like, well, I'll just like, you know, I'll decide next week or like, we'll go on one more date or like, you know, they're willing to do it when it's you, when it's your friends, you can see that the, the forest for the tree, that this is not going to work out. I find a lot of human nature in this book. I find oh, it sure. a very compelling kind of realistic way that families operate the way that the way that relationships often develop I find the relationships I find Eleanor and Edward's relationship I should say because Colonel Brandon's and Marianne's is like more dramatic and so romantic romantic it's so romantic I like the natural progression of it I like mm -hmm. the obstacles don't seem unrealistic or um unusual really per se I, I kind of like the everydayness of their story. Like, there is a lot of drama and heartache and heartbreak it just in the everyday living. And I think that's what I like about their story. And I am very much more forgiving of Edward for that because eventually, he's he is genuinely always trying to do the right thing. He just doesn't always he doesn't always get there. Or he does the wrong thing in trying to do a different right thing. And he's just kind of a mess. I mess. mean, Edward's kind of a mess, but I it's mean, kind of I like it. I kind of like that mess. I mean, I do think it's interesting that Eleanor just forgives him all the, like, there's no, he never asks her for forgiveness, but she just does it. And, um, whether or not he really had anything to apologize for, he never promised anything to Eleanor, like, I get it, but the dude knew. Hmm. He knew that there were feelings there, and he just kind of let it play out, whether or not he was looking for a way out. He could have let Eleanor know. There could have been more open communication between the two of them. Well, but that's kind of Eleanor's M.O., isn't it? That you could have had more open communication because she could have had more open communication with Marianne. She could have had more open communication with Edward. True. But that's True. just not Marianne, or that's just not uh, Eleanor's nature. She is an internalizer, and I think in Eleanor's mind, unsaid is better than... But to her own detriment. And it is to her own. Yeah, it is to her own detriment. Inside and you're just suffering instead of sharing it with everyone. I feel like both of them. Marianne learns to be a little bit more self-contained. Yeah, they learn to balance. <laughs> Eleanor learns to let a little bit more out. Yeah. And it's good. It's good. Which it's is, good. Uh, like, it's, it's why story. they're, yeah, they're the true, they're, they're the true story of the book. It's the relationship between Eleanor and Marianne, mm -hmm. for me, that pushes sure. this one over. Beautiful. Talk about all of the the retellings and oh, the he, film version. Do you want to talk about? Okay, which one? What's your favorite? Um, it can be book or maybe your favorite retelling of. Well, I do have a little soft spot for Cork Books when they decided to do Pride and Prejudice and Zombies and Sense and Sensibility and Sea mm -hmm. Monsters. I mean, the Zombies one they made into a film. Most people are familiar with that one several years ago, but. Uh, they haven't done that with Sense and Sensibility, and I have to say, I just, I had read Sense and Sensibility before that, just a straight one, and then when I read Quirk Books, I just giggled all the way through, because it's so <laughs> funny, because what Quirk Books did, it was, it's all the, it's the, it's the whole book in there, but they just insert just weirdness, and it's just awesome, sea monsters, London isn't on the surface, it's under the water in the ocean in a big bubble, like, it's just like, it's, so it's Atlantis. It's like this this whole other threat happening. Yeah. So you're basically telling me they put sense and sensibility. Sense and sensibility in Atlantis. It's yeah, kind of like it's just it's just bizarre, and um, and I just really really enjoyed it. It was so fun. And Pride and Prejudice and Zombies was was a riot. And I mean, I love the film. The film is hilarious. And uh, you know, I like this idea of 
just trying to add another element to get people to come back to mm -hmm. classic literature and you it know use fun. whatever you you need to do with zombies sea monsters whatever but get people back to reading classics because all of the the dialogues the same it's just some of the classic scenes really in there are that are just bizarre. Yeah. The, really so the film version, the 1995 one that um, Emma Thompson wrote the screenplay for. So it's got Emma Thompson in it, Hugh Grant, Kate Winslet. I forget who plays Willoughby. Not important. I I do, I do love that. Number one, I love Emma Thompson, and I think her adaptation was really spectacular. It's it um, is beautifully written. Like the cut of the yeah um the, the, the cinematography was great um the costumes were beautiful all of that and i did have a conversation with my mom because we're she definitely instilled the love of austin for me so she she likes that version that you like i like better. the okay i like she, the version she likes from the 2008 ones. well just because they, they do a more thorough job in terms of sticking to the to the source material a little bit more but I, and she's not a big Hugh Grant fan, and she thought that Emma Thompson was too old to play Eleanor. And I agree with those things. I mean, Hugh Grant can play a bumbler like nobody else. He really, I mean, Edward is kind of, it doesn't of, matter. Edward is, is kind of a bumbler. He is a bumbler. I will it worked. But it worked. And see, I, but I love Emma Thompson because I feel like she can play that vulnerability so well. Like, mm -hmm. like at the end when she is just, when Edward has come to see her and confesses everything and, and that she just falls apart. Yeah. Like that is just so, it was so incredible. But you know, what puts it over the edge is that Alan Rickman is Colonel Brandon oh, and true. he is amazing. His voice, his self possession he has on screen for Colonel Brandon to, to be this tragic romantic figure, him carrying Kate Winslet through the rain you just you just can't you it's can't true. Beat okay that's that. true and i just love it and then um they cast whoever they had for the middletons and mrs jennings i'm going to winkle that out of you i mean it's just hysterical they play those lines so well and um what's his face house the guy from the house i know it in my you know mind who I'm talking about yeah. grumpy face mm -hmm. who is the the husband of um the Middleton's daughter. It's just with that dry, sarcastic humor all of the time. Oh my god! I just it was just amazing, and I love Kate Winslet. Her, now you're her, kind of selling me. <laughs> I find the chemistry between the 2008 version of Eleanor and Edward more believable. I think Emma Thompson is phenomenal as well. I just didn't find the chemistry between her and Hugh Grant particularly. They have such little time together, so I don't know what chemistry you're looking for. Well, I mean, but that's kind of the whole driving of the story, right? Is like they don't they don't have a lot of time together. Yeah, like, but you've where's got, the chemistry? <laughs> you've got. I need some. They remind me of the chemistry, like where you have like with Jane and Mr. Bingley, chemistry, and then you've got chemistry like Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy chemistry. Those are two different little forms hand of chemistry. Clinch. <laughs> so you've got chemistry, and I absolutely feel the chemistry between Alan Rickman and Kate Winslet. There's an age difference. I mean, Colonel Brand is supposed to be 35. She's supposed to be I know, teenager. I love how they play that. Like, it's so, I mean, like, it is a big age gap in the film. I love how they talk about Colonel Brandon, like, he's so mature and old, and I'm over here, like, really it's getting perfect. close to that. And I'm like, perfect. Mm. actually, I'm a little older than him. But that's, that's okay. Great. But, like, it's just, it's very interesting to me. Like, that level of chemistry, there's a more sexual bend there than you get with Jane and Bingley and Eleanor and Edward. Like, well, that, is, kind that of is a, a more toned right. down. Because there's, she's supposed to be this very externally passionate person. I think that's kind of the Yeah, the but comparison. still, but I mean, to me, Elizabeth Bennet, I don't know. She externalizes to some degree. But mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's this underlying chemistry there. And I don't think you're just, the way the characters I, I wanna, are written, I, wanna I don't the feel it. Part. I don't feel the heat between those characters on the page. On but the that's, screen. I, don't I don't, but I don't to. think it's like the same chemistry. Like, well, that's what I'm talking about. But like, I, I don't, don't find it very, but I find the connect, the, the chemistry of a connection much more believable in the 2008 one. I just do. You have to see, I don't think I, it's written. That I way. still think the night, but I, the actors, you know, <laughs> you just, they bring that out. That's kind of, the, that's how you're supposed to cast people. They're supposed to be like, it's supposed to be a believable relationship. And like the Emma Thompson, Hugh Grant one is just not as believable to me. 
And because Eleanor is my favorite character, that is what pushes the 2008 one. Now, if I could take individual people, like, mm -hmm. I agree with you. Alan Rickman, Kate Winslet, hands down, you're not going to beat that. That was like, I mean, let's be real. Alan Rickman is always a good choice. But even the even Always the chemistry she had with the 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 guy who played Willoughby, who I don't remember his name, but that's not that important. She but like, does an excellent job as Marianne. Like she, she does. plays that it's and embodies it. And I think Emma Thompson as an Eleanor individually does a really good job. I just didn't find that side mm -hmm. as. But I think they had like, and I like. I think maybe they had maybe ten minutes of screen time together. Right. The which, team at the most, I mean, which is very little because right. they meet up in London at some point too. So. I really loved the, and I really loved the. I I like the dynamic between the 2008 Eleanor and Marianne as well. Mm -hmm. I liked it. I liked it more. I now don't get me wrong. In terms of like, because this is this is the difference. <laughs> We're comparing a, what was a miniseries mm -hmm. to a movie. So of course you the miniseries has more time and really develops things more. Mm -hmm. I think the movie is phenomenal in terms of like getting the real backbone, the real foundation, the real dynamics that play, that make this book so fantastic mm -hmm. into a movie format. I think Emma Thompson, like hands down, did. It's hard to adapt a full length novel. Oh my gosh. As a, as a complete film. As a complete film. Hard. I mean, I think hands down, she did a fantastic job. I think the luxury that the miniseries had of time, mm -hmm. it, for me, improved that relationship between Eleanor and Edward. And since that's my favorite, What's so fascinating of the two. about that is that you it's do really not nice. like the miniseries of Pride and Prejudice, but you like the Kieran. I know, but it's for the same reason. It's because I don't believe, I don't think the chemistry between okay. Elizabeth and Darcy in the miniseries is particular. I just don't really. But that's like the whole novel laid out for you. Uh, they right. Don't, they don't skip a line. Right, but I just it's didn't the find thing. the actors. I found them to be too old. I didn't. I didn't. Find, <laughs> I think they're great actors. I just think they were too old. For them. Like I just didn't. I just didn't find. Um, what's his name? Shoot. And what? What's his name? Colin Firth. I didn't find Colin Firth to be the same, like whoo -hoo, Darcy that I did <laughs> Matthew McFadden. Yeah, Faden. Faden. Matthew Faden. You ladies, you know who I'm talking about. Between Barton and Della Ford. There was that constant communication which strong family affection would naturally dictate. And among the merits and the happiness of Eleanor and Marianne, let it not be ranked as the least considerable that those sisters, and living almost within sight of each other, they could live without disagreement between themselves or producing coolness between their husbands. Goals. <laughs> yes. Everyone gets along, a little distance never hurt, and they were able to... Coexist. Coexist together functionally. So next week it's Halloween. Ooh. And in honor, really, of Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, <laughs> we're gonna be reading Pride and Prejudice. And we'll probably talk about Pride and Prejudice and Zombies as well. Because, because you know it's a hoot. It's I love it's it. great. I am not usually one who enjoys that kind of thing at all. Like you have to embrace the cheese on that one. You you do need to embrace the cheese, but like I'm notoriously like anti-gore or scary or spookiness or even really much level of creepiness at all and I enjoyed that I enjoyed the movie I enjoyed the book I thought it was great that but is. that's what we'll be doing next week so if you're reading along with us and you've been waiting for Pride and Prejudice this is your moment time to shine mm -hmm. the her most popular book of well them all. deserved it is her a good it's a really book. good book it is really good it's a really good book snappy dialogue sister relationship <laughs> great great characters you're great, really great. rooting for all of them yeah well Lydia could jump off a cliff but yeah okay so join us next week for pride and prejudice and make sure you like and subscribe so you don't miss any of our adventures in our falling for austin we'll see you next time bye, bye. We're charming. We're funny. Follow us. <laughs> like and subscribe. <laughs>